officials in search of loopholes justifying budget cuts. Native oratory makes clear that the, represent the representatives of indigenous polities saw these summer visits as assertions of autonomy and British forces willingness to host them as an acknowledgement thereof. When justifying these visits, Native leaders certainly invoked the oral promises uh, mentioned by the Treasury official, along with the longevity of British Indigenous military alliances. But they also made clear that they did not feel the need to regularly secure the British state's permission to undertake the visits. Shortly after the War of 1812, Britain's Indigenous allies living south of the border set the pattern that would hold uh, through at least the era of the Canadian rebellions of 1837. They would assert a right to associate with whichever empire they wished, regardless of lines drawn on the maps in Western capitals. For example, in the summer of 1816, a number of these US-based but British-affiliated uh, leaders visited the British post on Drummond Island in Lake Huron. Wabasha, a leading Dakota chief, addressed an estimated uh, audience of 500 British and indigenous listeners, explaining that his community would continue to insist upon British ties, despite their presence uh, south of the border. Though there is a barrier unexpectedly placed between you and us, he said, yet we stretch our arms over all obstructions and reach our English father's hand, which we hold with a strong grasp, and never will let it go as long as we live. Deep into the 1830s, Britain remained connected to its US-based US indigenous allies through summer visits undertaken by native groups of their own initiative. These visits did not take place in secret, away from the gaze of the American state. Instead, American policymakers knew about them and devoted considerable energies to stopping them. These exertions were often in vain. No American was more frustrated by these annual assertions of indigenous sovereignty than Lewis Katz the longtime governor and Indian Affairs Superintendent of the Michigan Territory, who would eventually become Andrew Jackson's uh, Secretary of War and a failed Democratic nominee for president. For Cass, Britain's support of these border crossing visits was a violation of American sovereignty, which was founded upon an authority over all the people living within American borders, including Native people. Moreover, by maintaining its ties with these allies, Britain was asserting an unfair advantage in the preparations for a third Anglo-American war that both American and British policymakers expected would take place sooner or later, and which did indeed uh, almost take place during the 1837 Canadian rebellions when many American sub settlers supported the rebels and their kind of tense exchanges between the governor of Canada and President Martin Van Buren. Um, so that's a, a what if that is not a ton of people know about, at least in America, but it's part of the story as well. So thanks to Cass's efforts, the federal government protested formally to London about its policies toward indigenous communities in the northern borderlands. In 1819, Cass wrote a long memo of complaints to which he attached a number of supporting documents. These were forwarded to Secretary of War, John C. Calhoun, who passed them along to Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, who sent them to London via Ambassador Richard Rush, who finally presented them to the British Foreign Secretary, the famous Viscount Castlereagh. Large quantities of clothing, arms, ammunition, and many other articles are annually distributed by the agent at Malden Island and other British posts to Indians living within our jurisdiction, Cass complained. The people to whom these presents are distributed live within our jurisdiction, and whatever may be the relation between them and the United States, the British constitute a third party equally foreign to both of the others. Is it compatible with the honor or the interest of the United States that a foreign power should thus mobilize a body of people living within our jurisdiction? that by a timely and provident distribution of necessary articles to these savages, they should prepare and keep them prepared for such fearful consequences as accompany Indian hostilities? The British were unmoved by these American complaints. Castlereagh asked Lord Dalhousie, then the Canadian Governor General, to weigh in. According to Dalhousie, uh, who'd consulted his own kind of Indian department officers, the claims of Governor Cass are utterly unfounded and the circumstances greatly exaggerated. It would be unfair or unwise, he thought, for Britain to change its policies. The policy of maintaining a friendly intercourse with the Indians has been too long established. The harmless commercial interchange of furs for trifling articles of British manufacture is of too old a standing. The governor general was willing to reduce the distribution of Indian presence in the interest of peace with the Americans, but only as far as is consistent with the friendly civilities always shown to the Indians when they come to our posts. Furthermore, the Americans were kidding themselves if they thought a change in British policy would improve their own relations with native people living within the United States. Their rooted hatred to the Americans springing from much unkind and overbearing usage, the evident strides making their, to lay, they are making to lay hold of the, the hunting country, as well as the establishment of military posts as I purchase and conciliatory treaties are seeds of endless discord and enmity between the Americans and Indians to the westward. They are consequently the strongest arguments that the British government should be kind and friendly to those tribes that court its protection.
Frustrated but undeterred by Britain's refusal to alter its policies, Cass ordered his subordinates in Indian affairs, the individual federal Indian agents or ambassadors, to do everything in their power to limit native contacts with British forces. A position as Indian agent in the Michigan Territory required its occupant to engage in a complex role that combined diplomacy, law enforcement, trade regulation, uh, and intelligence gathering uh, amid a distressing geopolitical situation. Your jurisdiction, Cass explained in 1822 to a new agent stationed among the Ojibwes of Michigan's Upper Peninsula, will embrace a very extensive and very important frontier where the Indians are exposed to an undue share of foreign influence. The agent's job was to withdraw them from their custom intercourse and associations, mildly but firmly to support the rights and enforce the laws of the United States, to render them, the Indians, every service compatible with your own interests and with that just economy which is necessary, carefully to license the traders and to scrutinize their conduct and punish any infractions of the laws and to act as a vigilant sentinel at an advance post, which is quite the overwhelming job description. Uh, and after presenting the, this uh, daunting list of responsibilities, Cass admitted uh, to the recipient of the letter that he hardly expected these efforts to assert US uh, sovereignty to succeed quickly. This admission was entirely reasonable. For many years to come, indigenous communities in the borderlands, including a number of Ojibwe groups, insisted upon asserting their continued sovereignty and thus from an American perspective, impinging upon that of the United States by failing to abandon their custom intercourse and associations. The 18th and 19th centuries saw many native polities negotiate nation to nation treaties with the United States. These treaties, though often honored in the breach, continue to underpin indigenous sovereignty today. This is certainly true for agreements between the United States and indigenous groups who live deep within the union's boundaries and maintain ties with no other imperial power. But the histories of indigenous polities in the Northern borderlands, whose assertions of autonomy threatened American power and destabilized Anglo-American relations, make it especially clear that Native Americans were and are members of sovereign polities deserving of treatment as such. Thank you. All right, th thank you, Zach. Um, our next talk will be um, from Dr. Julia Lewandowski. Um, Julia is an assistant professor of history at California State University, San Marcos. She received her PhD recently from the University of California at Berkeley where the dissertation she wrote um, was awarded the 2019 prize from Shear, the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic. Um, her current book project um, explores how small indigenous nations across America exploited imperial transitions to defend land as property in the 18th and 19th centuries. Her work has been supported by a host of institutions, including the ACLS and the Huntington Library. Uh, Professor Lewandowski, it's all yours. Thank you. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I'm speaking to you today um, from the Luiseno territories, um, also known as Oceanside, California. Um, so recognizing the Lewis Daniel first and foremost as the historic and the contemporary caretakers of the land and the ocean um, that I live on. So what I'd like to do today is just share a brief example from my own research um, and then offer a couple thoughts about the way that we can keep thinking about sovereignty and law past and present. Um, so what my research really focuses on is probing the relationship between property and sovereignty. Um, and the way that this is most often talked about historically is the way in which Anglophone settler regimes used property rights and concepts as a way to undermine indigenous sovereignty and usurp indigenous lands, right? Property rights as a weapon. Uh, starting with the 1763 Royal Proclamation, the British sought to separate Native peoples from settler property regimes by mandating that lands only be negotiated by treaty. In the 19th century, both the U.S. and Canada employed reservations and the concept of federal trust land to deprive nation, Native nations of proprietary authority over their lands and subsume them under protection. At the same time, they held out individual property ownership as a key signifier of civilization, first withholding, then offering, and finally compelling Native peoples to abandon collective governance of their lands and adopt individual proprietorship through policies like allotment in the U.S. and the Indian Act in Canada. But 
These are not the only engagements of indigenous peoples with forms, legal forms and practices of property. My research studies some of the many native nations who weren't explicitly targeted um, by these legal weapons, uh, who didn't make land session treaties, um, didn't live on reservations and weren't the target of allotment policies. Without treaties for better or worse, their legal relationships and the status of their territories in relation to Anglo settler states remained unclarified. Some of them understanding property's potent connections to matters of sovereignty turned to legal property processes and practices to defend land and articulate authority. So I wanna share one example of a nation doing that. And that's the example of Abenaki and Sokoki peoples at Odenac um, in Quebec St. Lawrence River Valley. So after the conquest of French Quebec, the 1760-ish, um, the British made a consequential non-decision. Instead of converting the province's complex, feudal, multi-layered multi seigneurial system into square British townships of private property, they decided to simply allow the French system to continue, which they did ultimately until 1970. For Abenaki and Sokoki peoples at Odenac, a village on the St. Francois River, this extension was just the beginning of a pattern of British inaction. A long settled Abenaki place, Odenac had also been the site of a Jesuit mission and received two land grants from neighboring seigneurs for the mission's establishment around 1700. These grants were made ambiguously to quote, the Abenaki and Sokoki Indians and the Reverend Father Jacques Bigot, missionary of the Company of Jesus, formally incorporating Odenac into the French seigneurial regime. However, neither the priests nor indigenous leaders really acted as seigneurs in the, during the French era in that they didn't manage this land like a feudal estate. They didn't grant concessions to tenants. So for the first few decades after British conquest, Abenakis at Odenac defended their land and sovereignty largely through diplomatic means. They petitioned the British, invoking their role as military allies and demanded that the British re restrain their subjects from encroaching on Abenaki lands. But by the 1790s, as settler occupation intensified and British responses remained inadequate, Odenac's leaders began to turn to the legal system. In 1796, after the expulsion of the Jesuits prompted a lawsuit from a neighboring seigneur demanding the return of the original mission land grant, several Abenaki, quote, grand captains appeared in court acting in the name of the nation to clarify their boundaries. But just clarifying boundaries wasn't enough. In the next few years, they began to establish their authority and act as seigneurial proprietors. Um, in 1800, they appointed a procureur, which is sort of a cross between an attorney and an agent and sort of a French law entity. Um, and they charged this procureur with the responsibility of making concessions of land to tenants and collecting seigneurial rents and dues. Over the next half century, Odenac's series of procurers granted more than 80 concessions of land collected rents and pursued tenants in court for non-payment. Concessions were recorded by local notaries and they formed thousands of pages of Abenaki property records in present day Quebec archives. Seigneurial rents and dues were standard as were the privileges reserved for Abenaki seigneurs such as cutting firewood on tenant land. And I should say also that in the continuation of the French seigneurial system, there were also a lot of British um, administrators and high level officials who also became seigneurs during this time. However, Odenac was distinct from all other British seigneuries because they consistently identified themselves as a nation. When they appointed their first procurer, they made it clear that they had gathered in council and that they had, quote, consulted with those who have in all of their dish a quantity of land which they cannot cultivate. This not only reflected a political decision-making process, but signaled to Abenaki ways of understanding their land, invoking the common Algonquian concept of territories as a common dish from which many might eat. 
Moreover, pursuing seigneurial management had clear community benefits. Seigneurial revenues paid by both settler and indigenous tenants were used collectively, put towards the maintenance and repair of church buildings, and then to pay off the community's debts. Establishing legal proprietorship also became a way for Abenakis to control access and economic development along the river. In 1836, they petitioned for an exclusive provincial license to operate a ferry across the St. Francois River, describing themselves as the seigneurs and proprietors of the alluvial land on both banks. Finally, granting leases to tenants helped Abenakis defend their territories from unauthorized settler encroachment. Collecting rents was obviously preferable to allowing squatters to slowly overrun the boundaries of neighboring seigneuries and occupy their lands. Managing tenants was a physical means of defense. They visually established Abenaki boundaries on the landscape with their own fields and fences, but it was also a legal one. Evidence of Abenaki proprietorship and the locations of their tenants were recorded over and over again in Lower Canada's notar notarial and court archives creating an extensive and a precise record of Abenaki authority over their land. In the 1850s, nearly a century after they'd conquered French Canada, British authorities finally made a concerted effort to permanently clarify the status of indigenous peoples and lands in the province of Quebec, AKA Lower Canada. Their plan was to unilaterally transform a variety of indigenous tenures into trust lands managed by crown appointed land agents, what we would call reservations in the US. At Odenac, leaders treated their new land agent less like a provincial authority and more like a new procurer, and they deputized him to act in their interests. When he attempted to sell off portions of the seigneury, instead, they deposed him and elected a different community member in his place. Crown officials refused to recognize this alternative Abenaki agent with a government commission, but Abenakis directed him to act under their authority nonetheless. He continued to make leases and concessions for Abenaki leaders at Odenac for decades. So what can we make of this example? It's clear that Odenaki Odenak Abenakis understood that control over their land would never be won or lost by a singular British action. They had learned this lesson in the 1760s when the Royal Proclamation had failed to motivate British authorities to provide protection, to engage in treaty negotiations, or just to respect their autonomy, no matter how many times they petitioned. But the British extension of French land tenure in the province offered seigneurialism as a framework to control their land. It allowed them to do so not as individual proprietors under British sovereignty or within the quote protection of a crown trust reserve, but as a collective political entity that generated revenue, distributed land among community members, limited encroachment, and repeatedly persistently articulated their sovereignty to British authorities and local settlers alike. So a few larger thoughts about property and sovereignty um, that I was thinking through as I wrote up this short piece. Um, first, it's clear that property is fundamentally important to how we understand territorial sovereignty, especially in Anglophone nation states. Uh, but I think it's worth noting that this relationship unfolded in more complex and flexible ways than just the paradigm of the, the settler grid sort of unrolling across the continent um, and transforming indigenous territories into, into township squares. Um, Quebec, of course, was the heart of British power in North America after 1763, and it was there that the Anglophones, who most loved individualized private property, chose to extend multi-layered collective French seigneurialism for two centuries. And for indigenous people, property could be more than a cudgel wielded by settler regimes to demand acquiescence and assimilation. assimilation. It could be a flexible legal instrument enlisted in the support of land protection and community authority. Second, um, property helps me start thinking about what sovereignty is. The sovereignty event, is it a possession? Is it a legal status or is it a set of practices? I think as historians, 
we often look for and argue about decisive moments when indigenous sovereignty was lost as if it's just a thing that you hold and then someone takes it from you. Um, was that when borderlands became bordered lands? Was that when the Marshall Trilogy was handed down? Was it when indigenous criminals were tried in settler courts? Um, but Odenak Abenakis faced a really different context, a context in which the British would frankly not act decisively to make treaties, to force the Abenakis under their protection, or even to formally prohibit or allow their seigneurialism. In this context, Abenakis made seigneurialism viable as a practice of sovereignty simply by consistently undertaking it. Um, they appointed a pure procurer and they registered thousands of documents for more than 60 years. Um, and so finally, thinking about practices of sovereignty um, also leads me to think about the law as an ongoing domain where those practices um, are articulated. Of course, seigneurialism was only one of many Abenaki practices of sovereignty undertaken in the 19th century. Um, and of course, there's many other practices that they continue to undertake today. Seigneurialism is just the practice that appears really abundantly in the sort of traditional historical archives I was using. But I think that thinking of sovereignty as a set of practices creatively maintained over the long durée, both in and out of the view of settler authorities and archives can help us make better sense of a present in which indigenous nations continue to both practice and advocate for their sovereignty, even as historians continue to search for the historical moment where their self-determination was tragically irrevocably extinguished. Of course, this is also a present in which the US and Canada, despite their claims to plenary power over native peoples, have never taken the grim final steps of converting all reserved land into private property or decisively ending tribal sovereignty in Anglo-American law. Instead, what I see is that legal processes in particular continue to be a domain of contestation that native peoples see as worth participating in. Of course, it's a site of recent decisions like Silk Quatton in 2014, and of course, this summer's big surprise, McGirt. I hope that we can situate these recent victories within a rich indigenous history of creative and persistent legal participation in which imagined settler outcomes were not and still are not inevitable. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Um... Our next talk will come from Craig Urush. Um, Craig is a historian at the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, he's a historian of American political and legal history. He's the author of Settlers, Liberty and Empire, published by Cambridge University Press a while back, among many, many other works. His current project, which, which, um, to which his interest in this topic is connected, is tentatively, tentatively entitled Chiefs, Chief Princes and Owners of All, which will explore how Indigenous peoples in Canada and the United States from contact to the early 20th century used legal institutions to protect land, their land and, and, and their property. He's looking at the Nisga'a resistance to settler colonialism in, in British Columbia in the late 19th century. Greg, uh, all set. I think I would be better at this after months of <laughs> teaching and conference. Apologies, everybody. So I just wanted to say I wanted to thank uh, Dan Mandel for bringing us all together in the first place, and also to Michael, who has been a great host and set up this set up this Zoom link and kind of shepherded us all to this to this spot. So it's very much appreciated. I'm looking forward to the conversation. So I want to take us. Um, uh, forward in time to the 1880s and all the way over to the Pacific coast, uh, to the Canadian province of British Columbia, where there was a long and very intense uh, Indigenous rights struggle beginning in the 1860s and ending in the early 20th century and then being revived in the late 20th century. I want to just tell one sort of one sort of slice of that of that of that larger story, which involved the Niska people who are way up on the uh, where the current just south of the current Alaska British Columbia border. So in the 1880s, the Canadian province of British Columbia began to steal the land of the Nishka nation, forcing them onto tiny reserves. The Nishka resisted, appealing to the provincial government in 1887. 
The government replied that the crown owned all the land in the province, despite not having acquired it by treaty or purchase. Faced with this intransigence, the Nishka and other indigenous peoples in British Columbia began a long struggle for their rights, which as I said a minute ago, continues to this day. On the eve of contact with the Europeans in the mid 1700s, the Nishka had been living in the Nass River Valley for thousands of years. One of the Chesimshian speaking peoples of the Northwest coast uh, their oral histories say they were placed on the Nass by the chief of the heavens who created the world and sent his grandson to bring light to the earth, which was then in darkness and to teach the people how to be moral. The chief, the chief of heavens also decreed that uh, there should be one language or tongue on the Nass. And he also created for the Niska, at least according to their oral histories, a kind of unwritten law by which they, by which they were governed and had traditionally been, been governed. The Nishka lived in villages strung along the Nass River. Each village was made up of several wilps or households of people related through a common female ancestor. The wilps also held territories, which the members used to hunt on and to fish from, that is to use the banks to fish from, and which were managed by the chief. In this way, the entire Nass was occupied, a crucial, a crucial fact for the story I'm about to tell. The household lineages in each village had a great deal of autonomy with the various heads or chiefs of each wilp cooperating in a village council. The highest ranking chief of each village took the lead in dealing with matters such as trade and diplomacy and war. The autonomy of the villages in turn meant that there was really no formal confederacy among the Nishka, at least not, in the late, at least not up to the late 19th century, though they were bound by a common language and culture and could and did cooperate uh, for defense in times of war as well as engage in trade. The first Europeans to arrive on the Northwest coast and to encounter the Nishka came in search of valuable sea otter pelts in the late 1700s. The Nishka and other Northwest coast nations allowed the Hudson's Bay Company, which is the principal uh, English participant in the trade, to build forts on their territories explicitly with their permission. The trade in, Euro in, the trade in furs with Europeans was for the Nishka and for these other peoples on the Northwest coast an extension of already existing indigenous trade networks, which had long existed in that part of the world. Uh, in the mid 1800s, uh, the Nishka regularly visited Victoria, the main Hudson's Bay um, fort far to the south to exchange pelts for European goods. They also, beginning in the 1860s, received missionaries on their territory, though this was very much on their terms as the chiefs saw the missionaries as valuable conduits to an expanding Anglo-Canadian world. Neither missionization nor the fur trade compromised their territorial integrity, however, or significantly altered their social and political life. But the autonomy of the Nishka was challenged in the 1870s and early 1880s by ominous developments to the south. The Hudson's Bay Company settlement in Victoria had become a crown colony in the 1850s. The discovery of gold in the Fraser Valley in 1858, that's on the mainland, so just inland from where modern day Vancouver is, brought an influx of settlers, many of them Americans, to the mainland north of the 49th parallel, the dividing line between US territory and British territory, which had been negotiated in the 1846 Treaty of Oregon, where the modern day border is. The Hudson's Bay Company had it had in the 1850s in accord with long established English law and practice, signed treaties with indigenous peoples on Vancouver Island. But, and this is a crucial uh, sort of development in my story, but on the mainland in the 1860s, the new crown colony ceased purchasing land by consent. Instead, they adopted the radical position that the crown held the ultimate title to all land in the province, and they began to force the natives onto small reserves, a practice that British Columbia continued even after they joined Canada in 1871, right, when they confederated and the Canadians had been signing treaties to the west of them on the prairies, but British Columbia disregarded this practice uh, to the dismay of the federal government who repeatedly told them that they had to extinguish native title by purchase before they could then sell land to the settlers to preempt land. As the federal minister of justice argued in 1875, quote, no surrender of lands in that province that is in British Columbia has ever been obtained from the Indian tribes inhabiting it. I mean, he didn't know that there had been treaties in, in the early 1850s, but when he was writing in 1875, that was, that was broadly accurate. Um, moreover, he said, the reserves which have been made have been arbitrary, lacking the assent of the Indians themselves and were of course far too small. He noted that though it may be difficult at this lapse of time to obtain surrenders, that is to obtain you know, voluntary sessions. He felt that it was his duty to assert 
such legal or equitable, equitable claims as may be found to exist on the part of the Indians. So he's trying to force the province to uh, sign treaties. And he's actually just about to disallow uh, a provincial land act. The federal government actually had the power to disallow provincial, provincial laws. It was rarely used at the time and almost never used now. In the late 1870s, however, the position that we just saw from the Minister of Justice um, was changed and the federal government basically capitulated to BC's policy of refusing to sign treaties or acknowledging native title. And they, and they allowed the province effectively to continue taking native land without compensation and to confine the natives in the province to meager reserves on what was once their homeland, homelands. So when the reserve commissioner finally arrived on the NAS, they've been sort of dispossessing native peoples from sort of south to north. They finally get up to the, to the far northwest of the province. When he finally gets there in 1881, he carried out BC's policy, even though he was nominally a federal official. In a quick tour of the lower NAS and with minimal consultation with the NISCA, he laid out small reserves, opening up the rest of the valley to settlers eager to farm, log, and fish to preempt land. When surveyors arrived on the NAS a few years later in 1885-1886, the Nishka resisted. Near the upper, uh, the upper river village of Gitladamix, um, a party of armed Nishka told the surveyors to, quote, get off my land. Skadeen, the chief, echoed this Nishka cry of, of Sayin, which just means get off my land or get out, insisting, quote, that God gave us this land and that if white men want it, they need to sign a treaty and give us a present for our land. But such violent resistance ultimately proved futile, given the, given the growing power of the settlers, uh, forcing the Nishka to appeal instead to provincial and federal officials for justice. In the winter of 1887, delegates from the Nishka traveled to Victoria, the province's capital, for a meeting with these officials. There, they argued that the land was theirs and that it was unjust to dispossess them. As one of the Nishka told the province's premier, our reserve is very little and we have not got any timberland, neither have we got our hunting grounds. These are what we want and what we came for. We want you to cut out a bigger reserve for us. And what we want after that is a treaty. They did not, however, challenge, and this is actually important for uh, the theme of a lot of our papers here, that they did not challenge overtly the sovereignty of the crown. Indeed, they felt that they could be, quote, free under the laws of Queen Victoria on the top of our land. So they're sort of arguing, I think, for a kind of autonomy and freedom, but they're not willing or they're willing to cooperate and to have a kind of reciprocity with, uh, with, British, with British authorities and accept, you know, Queen Victoria as some kind of nominal sovereign. The provincial premier, uh, his reply was not so accommodating. He insisted, as BC had done for decades, that there was no such thing as native property rights that in his words, the land all belongs to the queen. But why, Smith asked the Nishka, do they need all this land? Especially once they are raised, quote, out of the position which you have held in the past when you were little better than wild animals that rove over the hills, when you required a large extent of land to gather berries from or for hunting over. So he's basically saying you don't need as much land anymore and you, wouldn't, you would need even less if you, if you were to become fully, you know, fully civilized, that, that is sedentary and agricultural. Um, only then would you need a great extent of country, the extent that you're asking for. And he implies that now we are teaching you better and uh, better in other ways, and you shouldn't need so much land. What's more, he offered them the promise that should they become fully civilized, they would get equal rights to the white settlers and be able to vote and to be able to preempt land themselves. British Columbia had denied them the franchise in the 1860s and actually stopped them from preempting, in many cases, what would have been their own land in the 1870s. As for the Nishka demand for a treaty, Smith, Smythe, this is the provincial premier, Smythe called it perfect nonsense and asked the delegates incredul incredulously where they had ever heard of such a thing. The delegates replied in the law books, adding that after a certain amount of land is cut out for the Indians, outside of that, we want such a law as the law of England and the Dominion government, that's the federal government, uh, we want such a law that uh, as the law of England and the Dominion government, which made a treaty with the Indians. So they already know about what the federal government had been doing in the other parts of Canada um, in the decades before, their, before this meeting. The delegates then told Smythe that there are quote, a good many Indians that can read and write. And they are the ones who say this themselves. To which Smythe replied, there is no such law, either English or Dominion that I know of and the Indians or their friends 
had been misled on that point. The meeting, not surprisingly, ended with nothing resolved. Provincial and federal officials agreed to send a commission up to the Nass River later in the year, but they did nothing fundamental to address Nishka grievances. Indeed, their repeated insistence that the Nishka didn't have property rights prompted this response from an exasperated chief. This is, this is when the commission gets to the coast later in 1887. And this is a long quote, but I'll, I'll read it in full because uh, I think it gives a good flavor of, of the Nishka position. So this is the chief that's just been told he doesn't own the land that he's standing on. What we don't like is the government saying, we will give you this much land. How can they give it to us when it is our own? They have never fought and conquered our people and taken the land in that way. And yet they, yet they say now they will give us so much of our own land. These chiefs do not talk foolishly. They know the land is their own. Our forefathers for generations and generations past had their land here all around us. Chiefs have their own hunting grounds, their salmon streams and places where they get their berries. It has always been so. It is not only during the last four or five years that, have we, have, that we have seen the land, we have always seen and owned it. It is no new thing. It has been ours for generations. If we had only seen it for 20 years and claimed it as our own, it would have been foolish, but it has been ours for thousands of years. The Nishka though did not give up. That is despite the fact that just repeatedly stymied uh, by these provincial and federal officials and these commissions, repeated visits to Victoria, petitions, they didn't give up. Stymied by British Columbia, they appealed to Ottawa, that is to the Canadian, the Canadian government, and ultimately in 1913 to the Privy Council in London, which was then the highest court in the empire. So it was above the Canadian Supreme Court, but they didn't get far there either. It wasn't until 1973 in the Calder case that the Supreme Court, the Canadian Supreme Court, finally recognized Nishka, Nishka claims as legitimate by holding that native title actually existed at common law, a position which British Columbia had spent the better part of a century denying. In 1998, the Nishka finally got what they wanted, a treaty with Canada guaranteeing their land and autonomy. Despite the current vogue for transnational and comparative history, the long struggle for indigenous rights in British Columbia has been largely, I think, ignored by US historians. Yet as, I, yet as I've tried to show, it is an important part of a larger story of the role that Anglo-American law played in dispossessing indigenous peoples in North America. BC's radical denial of indigenous sovereignty and property, I think allows us to see the outer limits of the Anglo-American moral and legal ideas in the late 19th century. The denial of British Columbia to even treat with the Indians then engendered, as we've seen a robust response from the Nishka and other indigenous peoples in British Columbia, a response which was rooted in their own ideas of morality and legality, ideas which continue to shape their struggle against the legacies of settler colonialism down to the present. That's it. Okay, um, th thank you. Thank you, Craig. Um, next up is, is Dan, Dan Mandel. Who, who did all the, the heavy lifting involved in organizing this, this, this panel. Um, Dan is professor of history at Truman State University in Kirkville, Maryland, or in Missouri. Um, he's the author. <laughs> um, he's the author of many books. Most recently, *The Lost Tradition of Economic Equality in America, 1600 to 17 or 1870, which was published last spring by the Johns Hopkins University Press. Um, he's the author of many, many other works, which which I'm sure many of you listening to this talk are are, are familiar with. Um, his current research project looks at the conflict and the, the uneasy coexistence between individual and collective rights in the United States is highlighted by, by the, the evolution of American Indian politics and law. So with that, um, Dan, it's all yours. Thank you, Michael, and uh, thank you for taking care of all the lifting on the technological aspects of this thing and getting us here to this day. Thank you everyone else on the session for making this a session and for those of you who were joining us, uh, bringing your questions and joining in the conversation afterwards. Uh, I'm speaking from the territory that is probably formerly Iowa hunting territory. In a way, it's kind of a, a good example of parts of North America who uh, we can't really say when by the time records were kept. Um, there weren't people living here anymore, but the Iowa's apparently did hunt here and uh, occasionally came by 
Uh, so they probably have the best claim to this area. In the wake of Columbus's voyages, European jurists debated how to deal with the indigenous peoples of the Americas. In the 1620s, Dutch lawyer Hugo Grotius constructed the first international legal code, embracing the Roman mode of creating multi-ethnic empires imposing a single set of laws. At about the same time, Italian jurists developed new ideas of human liberty and divided sovereignty. And they did this to justify their city's political autonomy within the Holy Roman Empire. That idea tempered the absolutist aspects of Roman law and emphasized how ideas of liberty and rights originated during the Renaissance as a collective concept. Now, England, which was a latecomer to the colonial game, began, began that game with the intention of establishing settlements in North America. So they focused on concerns about land and secure relations with indigenous peoples. Now under English law, conquered land became the king's personal property while unoccupied lands could be claimed and owned by settlers, which is why among the latter, uh, the Roman doctrine of terra nullis, of empty land gained strength. Still, reality and various other factors drove the colonists as well as the crown to obtain rights by agreeing to treaties with native peoples. One of the very first, the famous agreement between the Wampanoag Sachem, Massas the Massasoit, and the English at Plymouth on March 22, 1621, created, in my eyes, a jurisdictional system that would long govern Anglo native dealings, definitely in the United States. And I think one of the things we can talk about today is the, the, the similarities and the differences between what developed in the United States and what developed in Anglo Canada. While most of the terms in that agreement were equitable, Massasoit apparently made the unique promise that any of his people who injured the English would be sent to the colonists for trial in, in their courts. Subsequently, when such conflicts erupted, uh, particularly in the decades after 1630, Plymouth authorities negotiated first with the sachem for the appearance of the accused in their court, which made it in reality a diplomatic matter that maintained a large element of native sovereignty. This arrangement obviously met the colonist desires. And I think it's useful to th think about that this reflected a diversity that was embedded in English law. Um, there is this, uh, an older uh, trope in, Amer in US uh, historiography that um, there was a, 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 by the time you get to the 18th century, um, there is this sense uh, in, in England that there's only one sovereign, um, first the king and then parliament. But in reality, if you look at what's going on in England, um, the kingdom had many courts with intersecting areas of jurisdiction they had corporate entities that exercised a range of state powers, and they had long-standing norms of what were called half-alien juries, which were created starting in the Renaissance when controversies emerged between parties, particularly merchants, from distinct communities within the kingdom and even from Europe. This uh, system also highlighted how Indians and English held the collective concept of powers and rights rather than the dogmatically individual assumptions that we hold today. Now this evolving relationship between Anglos and natives would be shredded at mid-century, the mid 1600s in the wake of major wars as the colonists enslaved or employed many natives. But the English continued to recognize native sovereignty along and beyond the boundaries of their settlements including a pluralistic jurisdiction that brought intergroup violence and theft to a designated official who tended to settle those issues, those conflicts through negotiation. In the wake of the Seven Years' War, the 1760s, the Board of Trade told their imperial administrators that English criminal law would not extend to natives, so that in 1766, just for example, Virginia's governor warned that Indians had the right to deal with trespassers as they wished, 
So colonists in the colony of Virginia uh, needed to be very careful where they went. The new United States would continue this policy. The draft Articles of Confederation recognized Indian nations as sovereign and set up a census of all residents except Indians not taxed. In other words, outside the jurisdiction of, of each state. Although neither of those measures became part of the final version of the articles. Although Indian peoples were rarely discussed in the 1787 Constitutional Convention, they did appear in the final document in two places. The decennial census would exempt Indians not taxed. And the final version of the Commerce Clause, Article 1, Section 8, seemed to place Indian tribes alongside states and foreign nations and gave them the same status. However, Article 3, which, are, which outlined the jurisdiction of the new federal courts, by the way, Article 3 um, was a very kind of rough outline with not a lot of detail uh, beyond, the fact, beyond the fact that it ignored native peoples. Uh, that article, in fact, failed to mention native tribes, an omission that four decades later would spawn Marshall's famous ruling in Cherokee Nation v. Georgia. While Congress assigned Indian concerns to the Department of War rather than the Department of State, the first Secretary of War, Henry Knox, told President Washington at that time that Native nations, quote, ought to be considered as foreign nations. And a series of recently tr signed treaties gave tribes, it's explicit in the terms, gave tribes the power to punish US citizens who tried to settle on their lands. For decades, federal Indian policy continued in this vein with the Trade and Intercourse Acts. And until after, 18, after the War of 1812, between the Mississippi and the Appalachians, the boundaries between tribe, state, and federal jurisdictions remained actually quite fluid. Now we're all aware of how native sovereignty was eroded by American racism and grief for land. But the expansive vision of the autonomous individual also played a role, at least in the United States. Now that notion may have originated with Protestantism, this is interesting work on this, but it became politically potent during the Enlightenment as reflected in the Bill of Rights. And in the early US Republic, it evolved into this middle-class dogma that each individual was solely responsible for the success or failure, right or wrong actions. In 1822, those progressive ideals moved New York's legislature to extend the state's jurisdiction over the Haudenosaunee after a jury supported the Seneca right to execute one of their own for witchcraft. Eight years later, Georgia would point to that law as one justification for extending their laws over the Cherokees. Now, we tend to hurry past Chief Justice John Marshall's rejection of the Cherokee's appeal of the Georgia laws in order to get to his Worcester decision, while noting, noting the significance of his declaration that tribes were, quote, domestic dependent nations. That's a concept that is still, uh, still in many ways, kind of the controlling uh, concept of, of tribes, uh, of native peoples in uh, the United States. But the dissenting opinion by Justice Smith Thompson, endorsed by Justice Joseph Story, is worth examining because of its powerful affirmation of Indian sovereignty and the norm of pluralistic jurisdiction. Thompson began by showing why the court could and should decide the case, and then highlighted how Emil Vitell, in his hugely influential 1758 treatise, Law of Nations, held that a state in an unequal alliance with a stronger nation still retained its sovereignty and in fact, still retain a legal status equal to all other nations. Now, it's interesting to me because usually Americans wielded Vitale against native peoples because Vitale had defended the very concept of terra nullis and of settler dominance. And in fact, Georgia's justification for its laws over the Cherokees cited Vitale to that, in that way. Thompson then examined various treaties and concluded that since 1775, the federal government had regarded tribes as not only sovereign and independent, but as foreign nations. And that's a direct quote from his dissent. His dissent 
actually came out after the initial decision was read and is probably written at Marshall's behest. Indeed, one year later in Worcester v. Georgia, the Chief Justice incorporated many of its ideas in slapping down Georgia's laws and insisting on the Cherokee Nation's sovereignty over the people and the territory recognized by treaties with the US. Now, as we all know, Georgia ignored the decision and continued to impose its authority on the Cherokees. Soon after, Alabama and Mississippi also claimed power over Indians within their boundaries pushing to end what had been a fluid jurisdictional area. During this same period, the rising generation of American cultural trailblazers, James Fenmore Cooper, Catherine Sedgwick, the actor Edwin Forrest, and others, popularized the trope of the vanishing Indian. Their sentimental works depicted the original inhabitants of Northeastern North America as noble savages exterminated or displaced by the unfortunate but inevitable natural process whereby an inferior race was supplanted by a more powerful civilization. Those who resisted this tide, soon dubbed manifest destiny, would decay or die. Now, this movement returns us to the Wampanoags as surviving Indian communities in Southern New England became the first target of tribal termination in the name of individual rights. And indeed this, this effort to terminate tribes is what got me interested in this topic uh, to begin with. Two centuries after the English arrived by the mid 19th century, Indians in the region were literate Christians who lived in towns and on scattered reservations, working as mariners, farmers, domestics, craftsmen. Most also had Anglo-American or African-American relatives. And at that point, state leaders embraced a liberal rights, a liberal rights agenda, individual rights, alongside this racialist notion of the vanishing Indian that led them to call for ending the Indian's legal status, the subaltern legal status, that they could not vote they could not sell the land, but that land, that, that law that they could not protect land also protected those remaining reservations against trespassers to some extent, at least. It was a weak legal protection, but it still it worked. And natives who, who, who used those reservations as their home base um, jealously protected the, that status. They didn't want that status to end for that very reason. During the Civil War, the Mohegans and the Narragansetts, in fact, told the War Department, the US War Department directly that their tribes were sovereign and rejected any notion that their men could be drafted. They, they would volunteer and many of them did, but they denied the right of the United States to draft their men because they still had the, uh, so the sovereignty that, they, uh, that their ancestors had arranged uh, with, the, uh, with the English who had settled there. But the states of course ignored them and instead decided as a, as a Massachusetts legislative committee put in 1869, quote, the enterprise which is pushing the outside world ahead is shut out from the Indian plantation. And thus the Indians are shut in to comparative thrift thriftlessness and decay. And indeed by 1880, nearly all of the states would be terminated by, all of the tribes would be terminated by those states. That shift was soon reflected in federal policy and laws. Congress in 1871 declared an end to treaties. In 1885, made major crimes committed by Indians subject to federal jurisdiction. In the 1880s, created a network of boarding schools to inculcate American norms among native children. And in 1887, enacted the Dawes Law, the Dawes Act, allotting tribal lands among in, in native individuals leading to the termination of the tribes. Theodore Roosevelt in a 1901 address to Congress said, quote, these measures served as a mighty pulverizing engine to obliterate the remaining traces of native sovereignty. The crest of this movement may have been the 1924 grant of US citizenship to Indians. Ironically, at that point, many Americans, non-natives, had begun to question the gospel of individualism. Perhaps the most prominent was John Collier, 
who became head of the BIA in 1933, and one year later persuaded Congress to end allotment and recharge native sovereignty. But that measure also pushed tribal governance towards written constitutions and formal elections. Since World War II, tribes have been pressured in various ways to embrace American ideals of individual rights, and several Supreme Court decisions severely reduced the authority of tribal courts. So what I've found is that since the start of the English invasion of America, Anglo-American law in the United States, and from what I can see so far in Canada as well, has treated Indian sovereignty in often ambiguous and inconsistent ways. During the course of the 19th century, that law clearly shifted to shred native sovereignty, certainly in the United States, seemingly in Canada as well, not only to take their lands, but at least in the United States, to impose on them increasingly powerful assumptions about the blessing of individual civil and property rights, goals that over the century became more closely intertwined. As my colleagues here testified already, some native communities did find creative ways to survive this pulverizing engine, but that has been a struggle that continues today. All right, great, Th thank you, Dan. Um, some questions are coming in through on, on the board here and, and, and I'll read some of those, but I'd like to exercise some executive privilege and, and ask some, some questions of my own. I, I found these discussions interesting and, and, and provocative. And I've been thinking about a lot of the same questions in terms of my own research on the history of the Onondaga nation, a nation that has been particularly strident in its assertions of nationhood and separateness from the United States and the state of New York. Um, and also quite, quite adept to some extent to evading the, the TR's pulverizing force um, bit. Um, you know, when, when, I, when I teach these subjects, I ask my, I ask my students to begin and tell me something about it. I just say, tell, tell me something that you know about Native Americans. And every once in a while, I'll get one student who will say, well, they have sovereignty or they are members of sovereign nations. And, and, and so I go, okay. All right, what does that mean? And it's at that point that they start to stumble a little bit and be really uncertain about how sovereign these sovereign natures are. And, and I, don't, I don't think my students are, are alone in, in struggling with measuring the, the meets and bounds and, and the importance and, and the nature of sovereignty. So, so to begin with, I'm just gonna rattle off a couple of questions which you guys can can answer or ignore or whatever you want to do with them, but just some things that struck me in, in, in reading these papers and, and, and listening to some of them. But, but first of all, what is sovereignty? Um, when was this word first used in the context of American Indian polities? That's a, that's a question I feel like I should know the answer to off the top of my head, and, and I, I don't. It's a word, sovereignty, that gets thrown around a lot. For example, a contemporary example, both the Trump administration and the Biden administration have pledged themselves to upholding American Indian tribal sovereignty. Um, <laughs> I suspect the word means very, very different things to those two administrations and, and, and as well as to different groups of indigenous peoples. It, all, it always has. So I wonder when, when we use this word and, and, and you all used it, um, are we asking it to carry too much weight? Right, we have a term that you all used, but I don't think anyone precisely defined, and, and you're not alone in this. I read books all the time that mention Indian tribes are sovereign nations and they have sovereignty and they're exercising sovereignty without really defining what, what sovereignty is. Um, is there a difference between sovereignty and autonomy, uh, between sovereignty and, and, and independence? Um, can you have one of these things without the other? And, and what is necessary for sovereignty to, you know, endure or, or survive or persist and, and, and thrive? And, and um, Professor Lewandowski, she asked in her paper, I like the way that you, you phrased the question toward, towards the end of your talk. You, you, you said, you, you asked if, if sovereignty is an event or a set of practices creatively maintained over the, the long durée. And, and I wonder, is it that or, or, or something else? Is it a concept? 
Is it an institutional or political or religious structure or some combination of the three of those put together? Is it a way of life that is shaped and given definition and additional contour? As I say, take um, Craig Yerush to be sort of suggesting that, that, that takes its shape and is contoured through processes of, of, of engagement and, and contestation and resistance to the settler state. Um, is, is sovereignty contig contingent? And, and if so, upon what? And, and so, I mean, I, I'm, you can tell I'm kind of sort of hung up, hung up on one part of your, your talk here. I, I'd love to hear your answers to those and, and, and the questions and suggestions that the rest of you out in the audience might have. There's already some questions coming in, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Go ahead, Julia. I can jump in, sure. Um, great question. Something that I think about a lot. Um, the answer is that there are many definitions of sovereignty, but I'm gonna attempt the a couple of definitions that I think matter to me in my work. So I think maybe the first conventional definition that I use when I'm thinking about native polities, especially in early America is uh, one that Liz Ellis offered when she's talking about the petite nations of Louisiana. And she says sovereignty is when there isn't a higher power mediating body that multiple polities collectively turn to to resolve disputes, right? That's, that's what it is to be sovereign. There's no big judge. Um, and I think that that works for the sort of early American or borderline borderlands paradigm of sovereignty that's about, um, you know, military autonomy, and there's often territorial distance, and it's articulated often in the in the context of conflict and competition. Um, but for my work, which is really more in the 19th century, um, and with an interest in sovereignty, you know, sovereignty under colonialism, um, I use um, the anthropologist, Mohawk anthropologist, Audra Simpson's definition um, of, she talks about nested sovereignties um, and that the idea that there are, you know, there are multiple sovereignties, sovereignty is not a fixed zero sum concept, um, you know, and that it's something that, as she talks about in her book, the Mohawk sort of interrupt settler sovereignty in all of these unsettling ways and that there are, are um, you know, there's multiple forms of sovereignty and that we don't have to be sort of like obsessed with like looking for the final boss all the time and saying, no, but who's the real, you know, who's the real big judge um, in this context. And, and the reason why, I guess, what makes what's important to me is I want to understand indigenous history in the terms of what contemporary indigenous people, um, you know, are struggling for. And so understanding how, you know, they practice sovereignty, fight for sovereignty and imagine futures of sovereignty in the present, um, you know, informs a lot of how I think about sovereignty um in the past i'll leave it at that maybe i'll just say two things quickly yeah, cool. just um, jump in guys yeah yeah so you know i think i mean it's a great question and i do think we use the term too as michael said we use it too casually as if we all know what it means right and often you know that it, that it lies a kind of contested history as julie was saying i mean i think when i when i was trying to think about I have been thinking about what, what are the Nishka asking for? Um, you know, they're not asking for Westphalian sovereignty. They're not asking to, you know, to be to be in sole control, I think, of their territory. I think they're looking for some kind of, I think Michael said, autonomy. They're looking for some kind of space within British sovereignty that they can certainly hold onto their land. They can continue their traditional practices. They can govern themselves, but they're not really making a radical demand uh, for separatism or for some kind of, you know, them being the ultimate decider. In fact, it's British Columbia, I think, that's really being the radical 
uh, making the radical click case that they're they're solely in control, even though, of course, British Columbia is completely forgetting they're actually under auto, you know, they're in a federal system, right? And I think that's another actually aspect of this. These, these are all, uh, this is all unfolding, at least in North America, in Canada, the United States, in federal systems where there's, where the sovereignty of the settlers is divided between local and central authority. And then in the case of Canada, in the, in the, in the, you know, uh, late 19th, early 20th century. U ultimately, there's, you know, it's kind of odd maybe for Americans. They, ultimately, London had the, you know, the Judicial Committee, the Privy, Ca Privy Council could actually have ruled in favor of the Nishka, and it would have been an interesting question what British Columbia would have, would have done then, right? So so I think this is all playing out in the in the context of divided settler sovereignty, and I think at least the Indigenous peoples that, you know, that I'm studying in this period of time, they're not really asking for um, you know, uh, complete autonomy for being the ultimate decider. They're looking for some kind of re reciprocity, some kind of blending of authority, some kind of autonomy, I think. But their, but their position is, I think, is very complex and nuanced. And as I said, it's really, in this case, it's really British Columbia that's the one that's being sort of radical uh, and, and making the kind of absolutist legal case, you know, against them. Mm -hmm. Dan? Uh yeah, building on, on, on what Craig and Julia said, um, I was struck, I actually went to my OED, right, to look at the, the, the earliest definition of, of sovereign and sovereignty. Um, and uh, I was reminded in, in some ways of Edmund Morgan's work, which was very influential in my development, the, the, his notion that sovereignty initially, um, there's this old tradition that it is a one, there is a single individual, a, a monarch who is sovereign. Right, that is literally the sovereign, the source of all law, um, and that is the OED's earliest definition: is is a sovereign, an individual. Uh, but then it gets fuzzier, right? Uh, and one of the things that I mean, Morgan Morgan's thesis is that uh, when the Americans declare independence and try to create a confederation, they have to deal with the question of where sovereignty lies. So they have to basically invent a new notion of divided sovereignty, because this was in, in the, 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 the main core of the issue in the American Revolution, where sovereignty lies. OK, so they divide. They created this this uh, this this uh, uh, this republic where states have some sovereignty and the national government has some sovereignty. Uh, it's a notion of where political power lies. So what's interesting is that native peoples also have pieces of that, but they don't have the status within this structure, formal status within the structure that states have. And if I could kind of pose a second question, picking, pick, picking backing on that, um, are Native peoples have benefited in some ways by this informal arrangement of powers, and in some ways it seems they've suffered because this is informal arrangements so that people or, or the institutions that, that, that have more military power, more political power can impose the, the limits on them, right? It seems to be one, one problem, but I don't know. Um, your question, Michael, original question of sovereignty, this is an evolving concept, right? And it's not a single direction. It's not going from individual monarchs. And by the way, the earliest, uh, you asked the question early on, what was the earliest connection of the word sovereign with native peoples? And my Spanish is not up to it, but I actually think it's, um, I wrote this down. It's uh, uh, Vittoria's uh, criticism published in 1534. Okay, of the uh, conquistadors, and he's arguing for the sovereignty, the power um, of Incan, Incan rulers. I think, and he's using the Spanish term for sovereignty and saying that Inca rulers deserve, or Mayan rulers, I'm not sure which, I couldn't find the full book, just an excerpt. So I think it's, it, it's an early term that, that the Span even the Spanish are using in reference to native peoples. And so I, I guess my point is, it is an idea that Europeans are wrestling with when thinking about how they're relating to or imposing their systems on native peoples. Um, uh, we, 
we, we have a, a question. <clears throat> well, I wonder, I thought it, <clears throat> excuse me, thought I would read a question to you from uh, Brad Dixon that came in. I think it's, it's, it's a fairly broad question. Um, he, he, he asks, when natives invoked law in these cases, do you think that they were doing so instrumentally to their best advantage or were they trying to incorporate their own legal concepts into the body of law? In other words, did natives in the 19th century ever succeed in forcing colonial legal regimes in Canada and the United States to recognize indigenous legal concepts that were quite different from European ones. How much, if at all, do you think native ideas shaped the law in Anglo-American settler societies? And I imagine that probably changes and depends on where you look at what times, but what do you all think? Well, I, oh, Julie, why don't you go first, Julie, and then I'll go. I, 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 yeah. Okay, we'll, yeah. we'll go chronologically. Yeah, exactly. um, I'll answer this by way of also answering the previous question about Alan Greer's book, Property and Dispossession, um, which I love very much um, and think with very much. Um, so my answer, were Abenakis acting instrumentally or incorporating their own legal concepts? I think the answer is both. Um, and the way that I relate to Alan Greer's book here is basically he argues that there isn't this like insurmountable gulf between settler legal concepts and native concepts, especially for managing land. Um, and that in particular, French seigneurialism, which is just full of reciprocal obligations, ongoing like present giving and refreshing of relationships through presence, um, and, you know, like sort of a nested, um, you know, hierarchies of obligation and protection. Um, in particular, what just, it just wasn't necessarily like a huge gulf um, to cross. So I think the answer in some ways is that I think, well, and you could, someone can argue with me about this, but I, th I think that there's maybe a trend in the scholarship that's away from, you know, really seeing native concepts about land as, as a, this totally discrete um, body of understanding from, from um, settler understanding. So I think, I think that the answer is that there just wasn't necessarily always a conflict. And I think that's especially true in French law where it wasn't, it was much less about, you know, participating in some really formal exercise. It was often about just showing up in front of a notary um, and he'd write it down in his book and you'd pay him a little bit of money. And like, that's, that's what the law is. And so they were writing things down in Abenaki sometimes. Um, and then in terms of, you know, native legal concepts making their way into Anglo-American law, like that time when that's happening is the present. Um, you know, the articulation of the concept of Aboriginal title in Canadian law, um, you know, since... 1997, I guess, like we are living um, in that moment of native concepts being articulated um, in Anglo-American law. Um, and so far in Canada and also not so much in the US, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, well, let me just, I mean, I feel like almost just saying ditto because I'm about to say exactly the same thing. But yeah, I mean, first of all, I think Greer's book is enormously valuable for thinking about this because the central point he makes is, at least in the early modern period, I think mean, he doesn't think this is true in the 19th century where he thinks there's a divergence, but in the early modern period, argues that there's much more similarity in the way they think about not just property, but space, territory, right? And, 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 and I think he gives the framework for not sort of dichotomizing these two, these two sort of worlds, right? And, and bringing them together. In terms of the use of um, of you know English um, or Anglo American legal concepts, I mean this is really close to the heart of my project. And the sort of provisional argument I'm, I'm developing with Anishka is that they are actually the ones who, in effect, discover um, the Royal Proclamation. This happens actually after 1887, and they actually, in their petition to the king they actually reinvigorate the proclamation uh, that there had been a legal case the same year they were in Victoria 
called the St. Catherine's Milling Company case, which had to some extent acknowledged native title. I mean, it would have it would have been a bad precedent for British Columbia with their just complete denial. But it was a very attenuated kind of a use right. The argument of the Privy Council was ultimately, well, there's native title, but it's just a kind of use right. It depends on the grant of the crown or the sovereign, right? And which was expressed in the Royal Proclamation. And what the Nish could do is they take the Royal Proclamation and kind of flip it around. They argue that they have, you know, a pre-existing right by occupation and long usage, as well as they make a kind of quasi-religious argument from God, which could either be the fact that some of them are Christians, or it could be this older mythology I was talking about, or this older belief I was talking about at the start of the paper. But anyway, they make, a, I think, a very powerful kind of kind of um, argument about, about occupation in particular and long use. And then they argue that the Royal Proclamation expresses that, but the Royal Proclamation doesn't create the right. And I think that that's actually one of the things, as Julie was saying, that brings that concept that reinvigorates that English concept of common law or creates the English concept of common law title. I think it's largely an Aboriginal creation with the help of, you know, with the help of English lawyers. And I think at least, you know, in the, in the scholarship that I've been reading, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm originally a Canadian, but I feel like kind of a stranger sort of walking into this Canadian historiography doing this BC project. I think there's still too much of a tendency to treat the natives as if they were sort of being led around by these by these English uh, or Anglo-Canadian legal advisors who were sort of feeding them the legal arguments. And I just think the evidence, particularly in this 1887 meeting, when they had only had a sort of very passing acquaintance with, you know, any any sort of serious encounter with with English law, they're already they've already got arguments and they're just looking for a, a sort of a vessel or a framework to put them into. But I think it would be a mistake to to not really acknowledge the sort of the, the central role that sort of indigenous concepts play and sort of feed into in, into into an English law, which is Dan, you know, and, and, a, and a wider European uh, law, which as Dan points out was not entirely hostile, right, to native title or native native property or native self-government, right? But I think in particular in the Nishka case, they're the ones I think who are who are creatively interpreting English law and asserting it in a way that combines with their own or meshes with their own pre-existing ideas about law and property and occupation, et cetera. Uh, if I might chime in, um, I wanna draw our attention uh, to the role that native ideas about kinship maybe plays in this story. Uh, and particularly with the, the federal Indian agents that I write about, um, you know, the, the federal government wanted to see them as kind of interchangeable cogs. They're just somebody's appointed into this role and then they're just a kind of representative of, of the state. Um, but native people really wanted to kind of, uh, in, in many cases, sort of bring them into native politics through kinship. And so they would take advantage of the fact that um, the you know American officials wanted to refer to themselves and to the president that they represented as like the great father of the native people. Um, and you know this goes all the way back to like Richard White's The Middle Ground, but like uh, native people were happy to use that language because to them it could mean something different and connote more obligation than kind of a hierarchy. Um, and you know they tried to kind of make this real by uh, incentivizing individual Indian agents to marry into tribes. And then that would bring under their law certain serious obligations. Um, and uh, that certainly had real kind of practical effects because you can see cases where Indian agents are accused of favoring like one community that they had married into over others when they're dispersing annuities, uh, for instance, or, or negotiating treaties. Um, and so I definitely see native kind of rules and laws about kinship as, as factoring seriously into how things happen on the ground. Um, I also think, uh, what we can loosely call criminal justice, uh, although it has elements of, of war as well. I can, the boundary can get a little hazy, but that's that's definitely part of this, this story as, as well too. And you see kind of interesting negotiations when, particularly when white settlers have have been allegedly killed by by native people and trying to negotiate how that will work. And um, you know, that's, that's definitely an area where the, the state was trying to kind of assert its, its role uh, and sometimes successfully and sometimes not. But I can think one story that goes through my head a lot is that Think about this incident where um, a D uh, Dakotas had allegedly murdered four American settlers. Um, and eventually the tribe was persuaded to give up uh, people, but they really wanted to allow uh, a young man who had allegedly committed the crime. His father really wanted to go and be punished in his place instead of his son. And so there's a long argument about that. And in that case, uh, the Americans ended up winning out and the sun had to go instead, but um, it didn't always go, go down like that. So yeah, I would just say that that kinship or marriage and, and criminal justice are both kind of 
areas where you see these contestations and where, where native legal ideas are certainly in the picture. I think it's also useful to, to, to highlight how for both settler regimes, settler legal systems in the US and in Canada, uh, as well as for native peoples, the laws, the systems are evolving or shifting over time as are native systems, of course. And so the influence of one on the other, right? Uh, we can tease out piece of that as Zachary just did the courts of kinship and, and, and that sort of thing. I was really, uh, uh, I love Lisa Ford's book that deals with the era, the border area between the, the, the uh, uh, Creek territory, uh, between areas controlled by the government of Georgia um, and their, uh, the, the Muscogee Nations territory. There's this boundary area that both Muscogee people, other native peoples, and then Anglo settlers kind of move in and through. And it's an area that's subject to negotiation that supposedly federal courts are supposed to deal with, but they wind up just being negotiators and creating this kind of legal regime that combines native norms and Anglo norms. And I think that's kind of useful to keep in mind the other thing in terms of, of property rights and, and land and, and, and the way that native peoples as well as uh, settlers use land law, right? Um, when the English, and I know the English system best, when the English show up uh, along the East Coast in the 17th century, they're moving in England, they're moving kind of away from communal systems of land management. They haven't completely abandoned them, but they're clearly moving away from them. Native peoples are still very much connected with, in, with, with communal systems of land management. Uh, and the clash really, from what I can see, erupts in the 19th century, the mid 19th century. That's what I found in New England, um, where the, the Mohegans, the uh, Narragansetts, the different Wampanoag communities, one of the ways they maintain their families and their communities is through communal management, not for the marketplace, but to maintain the community of the land, of its resources. Um, where they run into difficulties, where they feel threatened is when trespassing white neighbors come in and start taking this stuff to sell to the marketplace. That's where they really start, you really see a clash between this communal management, communal norms, and the 19th century individualistic property ownership norms. One, one, uh, that one should exploit uh, resources for individual uh, uh, profit. Um, but I think that can change too. So um, like Julia, I see that native people can use that system as long as they're not faced with aggressive trespassers backed by state power. Can I ask Dan a question? I don't. Okay, there we go. Um, we're all gonna stumble over this. It's, it's, we're, we're getting on 6.30. Um, uh, Maybe, maybe we still have some questions out there. Um, I think with your answer there, Dan, I think that that offers a chance for the rest of you maybe to respond to Ian's um, question here. He asks, did any panelists encounter US or Canadian perpetuation of informal practice of property post 1800 or, or pick another date if, if you'd like in answering that question? Um, Ian says, not, not only just my students, but plenty of non-natives tend to equate the Anglo-American colonialism with a greater formalism of property, but this has not always been the case, as you well know. Um, I can take a stab at that. Um, my general take is that I don't think that property is a very formal enterprise um, in North America in general at any time, including now. Um, it is a Byzantine decentralized um, narrative experience. Um, so I think that, you know, you only own something to the extent that somebody else comes up to your boundary and says, no, the line's not here, it's here. And then 
you know, then you hire lawyers and you do title search and you, I mean, I'm a renter. So what do I know about property um, in the present? But I don't, I, I guess I think that, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the idea that the English loved um, formalized private property and what everybody really wanted was like a extremely explicit, clear, guaranteed title from one state. And that was like the only way they, that, that they would feel secure in their property. Like, I think that, I think that that is as a myth. And then I think a lot of people were um, comfortable with a lot of flexibility and in interpretation when it came to property, because um, there's a lot of opportunity um, in that flexibility. Michael, you're muted. Yeah, go ahead, Craig. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I mean, uh, maybe I can answer that a little bit. And, and then somebody actually asked me in the comments about the people surrounding the Nishka, because I think in a way they're, those two questions are related. I mean, I actually, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with, with Julia that I think it's, you know, it's much, the reality of property is much messier than, you know, than the first year law textbook about, you know, about real property. But I think in, at least in British Columbia, you know, there, there really was an attempt to, to take, you know, native space and really do, really draw boundaries around it and to draw lines and to, to formalize through a system of preemption. And what this actually did in the Nass River was actually, I think, caused conflict between the Nishka and some of the other Tsimshian peoples because they had actually been sharing um, various fishing spots. And um, there was a, there's a, they, every, every spring there was a great run to get these little fish called Ulishan where they would get the oil from. And the Nishka would fish there, their Tsimshian neighbors in Port Simpson, the Tlingit would come down. So there was a, all these native nations around who came to the, came to the mouth of the Nass. And you know, there had been conflict in the past, we know from European records and, and from oral histories, but they had worked out a fairly effective system of, of some kind of communal management. I don't quite understand how it worked. And when the reserve commissioners come in and they begin to draw lines, okay, you only get this fishing spot and you only get you know, this area along the riverbank. And you know, they tried some kind of common uh, property. They actually accentuated conflict amongst native peoples. And actually part of the complaints they're making to Victoria, which I didn't include in the talk is they're actually, in a sense, asking for the BC to somewhat arbitrate the disputes that in the fact that, that in fact BC's settlement policies have, have created. So, so there were, uh, you know, there was contested property in the NAS as, you know, someone asked me about this, but I think in, in part actually Europeans coming in or Anglo-Americans or Anglo-Canadians coming in and trying to impose grids and lines and trying to formalize things where things before had been messier actually, I think, caused conflict and caused, um, caused tension over resource, particularly resource access, not so much land, um, where it hadn't existed before, or at least not to that extent. Good. You're muted, Michael. Um, does anyone else want to jump in on this one? Oh, okay. Um, we, we have a, just a couple of specific questions um, that, that we can talk about here. Let's, let's, let me just get to um, Ed, Ed Reagan's question that just, just popped in here. Hi, Ed. Um, uh, Ed's question, Ed's done some research on the Rappahannocks. His question involves tribes who re remain you know, behind the frontier, using Dan's phrase for that. Um, he says, given the 1783 ordinance passed by the Continental Congress, do colonial street treaties still have merit? I asked specifically about Tidewater, Virginia, where tribes made county, provincial, and colonial treaties. There's a long history of Virginia acknowledging the Treaty of Middle Plantation at the end of Bacon's Rebellion, though earlier and subsequent treaties have been ignored. I cannot imagine that modern tribes have any recourse with regard to 17th century treaties, but how can these older agreements bear on modern realities especially given that several of the Virginia tribes now have federal acknowledgement. It's a relatively recent development there. I can't answer for Virginia, but I can talk about it generally. Um, the answer is that in Canada, they certainly have more merit than they do um, in the U.S. because there's a sort of, you know, unbroken chain of the British 
um, inherited this from the French and they said they'd honor all the French treaties. So there's sort of legal basis um, in law, whereas the US was sort of said like no fresh start. Um, so in places I look at, which are um, places like Louisiana and California, um, places that the US got um, from another European empire, um, the US move there is usually to say like, we don't care what treaties you made with Spain we're going to assume that Spain or France or whoever extinguished 100% of your um, title claims, fresh start, you know, you just have, you have no status. Um, in terms of, you know, within 13 colonies, I don't actually know. I mean, my guess is that those older agreements were pivotal piece of evidence in their federal recognition claims. Um, that I can yeah. say with some confidence, but I, I don't know what bearing um, they would yeah. have at this point. My guess is probably none. The, uh, yeah, this, that 1783 ordinance seems frankly, like frankly, a lot of blowing smoke uh, because then Congress goes ahead and negotiates a whole series of treaties with all, all the native nations uh, east, east of the Appalachian Mountain, uh, west of the Map Appalachian Mountain, sorry um confirming their land rights or large pieces of their land rights and so I, I haven't i have to look at that ordinance but my guess would be it's kind of an extension of the discovery doctrine if you will although it's interesting the uh the three marshall decisions do not refer to that 1783 ordinance at all i mean I, I, this is a I, i've seen it before but i haven't seen it in a while and i've been looking at those decisions pretty closely so I'm not sure it really has much clout in reality on the ground, that 83 ordinance. Uh, as far as the, uh, the, the, the pre, pre-revolutionary uh, treaties between uh, the colonies, individual colonies and tribes, um, because of the split jurisdiction between federal and states uh, jurisdictions, those treaties still have a lot of clout within the states. Um, that's in fact how, essentially how uh, New England, uh, the New England communities um, kind of upheld their boundaries and their, their autonomy by reference to, to often to these treaties and to the laws that followed on the treaties. Uh, so those regimes have a fair amount of clout within the colonies that made those, those treaties. So that would be my answer. Uh, Michael, you, why don't you, could you kind of add from your perspective, from the Haudenosaunee perspective about this question? <clears throat> state, state treaties are, well, for, for my purpose, the, the problems we're dealing with are, are state treaties negotiated um, within the United States, right? And some of these are negotiated before March 4th, 1789, when the constitution goes into effect and many are negotiated afterwards. And um, they, for, for many years, they mattered immensely in terms of, of litigation regarding um, land, land claims and violations of the Federal Indian Trade and Intercourse Act. But in, really since the Sherrill decision in what, 2000 and whatever, a um, couple years back, uh, these, the, the court essentially held the position that these, these, the injuries happened so long ago that any remedy would be more destructive than the original offense and that, that there, there's no, then there's, there's no legitimate remedy for these cases. So in a sense, they've been, they've been cast out. They are, Immensely significant, though, to Haudenosaunee peoples themselves, the ones I talk with and work with. And, and apart from the legal system, apart from the political system, apart from the courtrooms, they're immensely significant in terms of, of their understanding of where they are today, their relationship with the state, a, a relationship that still in, in many ways is a, a fraught relationship and, and a tense relationship, um, really, really a, regardless of which party is in charge of New York state, it's, it's, it's a fraught um, relationship. And, it, and it's, 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 it, these treaties are immensely important sort of identifying 
and explaining their sense of, of who they are and where they belong. For example, the 1788 treaty that the Onondagas negotiated, or it was, a, it was a fraudulent treaty negotiated with the state of New York where the state essentially acquired all of Onondaga's lands from Lake Ontario to the Pennsylvania line. The Onondagas, one article on that treaty guaranteed the Seneca, the Onondagas the right to hunt and, hunt and fish on the ceded lands. They've used those treaties, and, and, and these are still working their way through the courts, they've used these treaties to oppose New York fish and game prosecution of Onondagas who were caught fishing on waters off the current reservation, but that were included within that original deeds, original, original, original transaction. So I think to, to come back to Ed's question, which is, is, is one I think we all deal with when we study indigenous peoples in the Eastern part of the United States to be sure. These, th there's no rule why we can't keep bringing up these, these transactions and pointing out the provisions. I think Ed well knows that um, <laughs> the, the governor of Virginia still collects his tribute uh, under the treaty of 1677 and it's a nice photo op. It's also proof to groups like the Mattapanai and the Rappahannock that those treaties <laughs> are still in effect, right? Why, why go through the rigmarole of, of pretending they're there? So, so they, they, they still matter in ways that maybe the courts haven't, haven't got to yet. We'll keep trying. And I would, I would just point out that that really highlights right there, the things you've, you've, you've pointed out, highlights the kind of the, the broad nature of law and sovereignty that it still has these significant on the ground meanings that, that to some extent, that, that kind of transcend the, the, uh, uh, the, the more narrow notion of law. Yeah, that, that's a great, a great point. Um, we're, we're, we're out of time. Um, I wanna thank everyone who stuck around to the end. I wanna thank the, the, the panelists, Zachary Kahn, uh, Julia Lewandowski, Dan Mandel and Craig Urush. Um, this will be available on the um, AHA website at some point in the future. The process isn't quite clearly explained by the AHA, but it will be there at some point if, if you all want to revisit this. Um, uh, thanks everyone for coming and, and thanks to the panelists and um, best of luck in this new year. Stay safe, everyone. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, thanks audience. So much. Thank you.